I left off segment one talking about this um, treatment right here, um, hypophysectomy, and ugly as it looks. Um, and I told you I had a, when I was in nursing school, I had a patient that had this done that I was assigned to me. And I was monitoring the intake and output, which is very important following the surgery. And my client actually developed this right here, diabetes insipidus. And if we go back to that original page where I had what the pituitary gland does, there's this hormone right here, antidiuretic hormone. This is produced by the, one of the two produced by the posterior pituitary gland and antidiuretic hormone is a little bit difficult to understand because it starts with the word anti but if you break it down anti means less diuretic means p so if we increase our antidiuretic hormone that's going to mean less p we're going to retain water have high blood pressure dark concentrated um stinky p and if we have a decrease in our antidiuretic hormone that's going to mean more pee. So we're quickly going to become dehydrated, lose electrolytes, and our pee is going to look light colored and watered down. And so that's what happened to my client. Um, had the pituitary gland removed, of course, then he had a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone. And with a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone, that means that he started making um, huge amounts of urine. And as he made more and more urine, he became dehydrated. In addition to monitoring intake and output, watching for diabetes insipidus, the other thing that you want to do is avoid any activities that might cause a Valsalva maneuver. And that's what happens when like someone's straining to have a bowel movement. So other things I have in here, sneezing, coughing, straws or, or mouthwash, any of those things um, can dislodge the clot that's formed. The opposite of hyperpituitarism is hypopituitarism. And just like with the hyper, it really depends on whether this happens to someone as a child or as an adult. Um, if it happens as a child, then it can stunt the growth and be called dwarfism. So dwarfism is comparable to gigantism, um, happens during childhood. If it happens during adulthood, when full size is already reached, then it's called panhypopituitarism. Um, Symptoms might be called Simmons cachexia sometimes. Again, the signs and symptoms, which I have over here, are going to have to do with the decreased production of all of those different hormones, and they're going to be pretty much opposite of what we saw with um, hyperpituitarism. So um, decreased of growth hormone, what do you think that's going to cause? Um, small size, if it's a child, or in the adult, um, decreased muscle and organ size. So um, smaller muscles, decreased strength. Um, for ACTH, it's a decrease in that can cause hypoglycemia. Um, not enough thyroid stimulating hormone, then we can have hypothyroidism. Decrease in FSH and LH can result again in um, loss of libido, um, gonads may be atrophied, and amenorrhea in females. And then how about decrease in in melanin stimulating hormone. Um, if we don't have enough melanin, it's going to make us have paler skin. So pallor would be another um, sign and symptom. Down here, I tell you to pay particular attention to the um, patient teaching box on the bottom of 1018. And on all of these, wear a medical alert bracelet is going to be part of your teaching. Um, for this particular disorder, um, hormone replacement therapy will be necessary throughout life. And then also um, teaching the patient to become familiar with the signs and symptoms of inadequate or excessive hormone replacement is very important. Here I have um, a video clip if um, you want a little break of my favorite dwarf Trumpkins from Narnia and Prince Caspian. And again, in children, growth hormone is administered until the growth plates of the long bones close or the person no longer responds to the drug to prevent or treat dwarfism. If this happens in the adult, then they've already reached their height, so we're not worried about that as much as the other, as replacing the other hormones. So that covers too much and too little of the anterior pituitary. And um, let's talk now about the posterior pituitary and that ADH, that antidiuretic hormone that I talked about earlier. And so diabetes insipidus is going to be um, too, 
too um, little of the antidiuretic hormone. And then SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone is when we have too much of that. But we'll start with diabetes insipidus. So diabetes insipidus is um, ADH production is not sufficient or the kidneys don't respond to it. And so there's three different types or um, pathophysiologies behind diabetes insipidus, and we'll talk about each one individually. We have um, nephrogenic, neurogenic, and dipsogenic, and their names kind of give them away. Nephro means something's going wrong in the kidney itself, neuro um, happening in the brain, and then this one has to do with um, water intake. So let's talk about nephrogenic first. In nephrogenic, plenty of ADH is produced um, by the pituitary gland, so it's not a problem with the pituitary gland, but for some reason the kidneys don't respond. So here I have a, a kidney holding up a sign and says, I, no hablo inglés, I don't understand, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do even though I'm getting the message. So this is a problem in the kidneys and it's nephrogenic, diabetes insipidus, so um, kidneys don't respond appropriately, so overproduction of urine and the associated signs and symptoms of dehydration. In neurogenic, just as it suggests, um, neuro meaning brain, neurogenic is a problem with the pituitary gland itself, either um, de defect in production or defect in the secretion of ADH. So here I have, um, there, there's not enough food or not enough ADH. So the kidneys would love to do what they're supposed to do, but they're just not getting enough from the pituitary gland. So the problem's in the brain itself. And then this last one is kind of interesting. Dipsogenic is a disorder of thirst stimulation. So excessive water intake is what causes um, dipsogenic diabetes insipidus. Um, it can actually be a psychiatric condition. So some of my top things to know about diabetes insipidus, first of all, it has absolutely nothing to do with diabetes mellitus. We're not talking about blood glucose here. Um, number two, results in freakishly massive amounts of urine. Um, for example, greater than four liters in 24 hours. And because of that freakishly massive amount of urine output, it's going to result in signs and symptoms of dehydration. So the person gets very dehydrated or hypovolemic. And we learned those signs and symptoms way back in fluid and electrolyte class. So tachycardia is a compensatory mechanism. Um, blood pressure drops due to low volume. Weakness and confusion can result. And of course the person is going to be very thirsty. And the way we would treat that is of course correcting the underlying problem but also um, making sure we give them IV fluids so that they don't remain hypovolemic and go into a hypovolemic shock. So opposite of diabetes insipidus is SIADH, or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So I have first bullet point, it's opposite of diabetes insipidus. So um, you could um, go back one slide and put in the opposite terms for what results from um, SIADH. And so the signs and symptoms, instead of being hypovolemic, they're going to be hypervolemic. So fluid volume overload. And with fluid volume overload, instead of having low blood pressure, we're going to have high blood pressure. And instead of having um, dehydration, we're going to have edema. And instead of having massive urine output, we're going to have very little urine output because it's antidiuretic. It's holding that urine in. I've included some links for you. Here's one. Um, here's another. I kind of liked this one where it compares and contrasts diabetes insipidus to SIADH and they um, have them right next to each other. It's another video you can watch. And then um, if you are still having a little bit of confusion regarding what's the difference between the two, um, here's a third video. This one's about, it says it's 13 minutes long, but it's very good. But Important bullet points for, to remember for SIADH is that it causes excessive retention of water instead of um, excessive urine output like with diabetes insipidus. So SIADH is sometimes called water intoxication because excessive retention of water. And with water intoxication, um, just like this word intoxication suggests, the symptoms mirror being drunk because it's causing swelling in the brain. And so um, drowsiness, headache, and listlessness due to that swollen brain tissue. Plus, um, this can even progress to the extreme of seizures and even a coma. 
Next, I'm going to talk about the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland is located um, above the kidney, and it still has to do with the pituitary gland, however, because one of the things that the um, anterior pituitary gland secretes is ACTH, or adrenal corticotropic hormone. And this controls the growth, development, and function of the cortex of the adrenal glands. It also controls release of glucocorticoids and adrenal androgens. And it also has to do with aldosterone uh, secretion a little bit. So the two are connected. But when we go to the adrenal gland itself, um, it's really divided into two parts that you can see here, the medulla and the cortex. And within the medulla, we have um, things that like adrenaline. And if you remember, um, adrenaline is um, part of your fight or flight response. And then in the cortex, we have um, three things. We have our mineral, mineral corticoids, and these have to do with um, water and salt regulation because remember, um, sodium is uh, one of your electrolytes as well as potassium, but just um, simplified water and salt regulation. We have glucocorticoids, and these have to do with metabolism, blood sugar, inflammation, and the immune response. And then finally, we have the androgens and estrogens and um, we also make those, of course, in our sexual organs, our ovaries and testes, but um, these are also made in the adrenal gland, and so they provide some of our secondary sexual characteristics. So the three disorders I'm going to talk about that have to do with adrenal disorders are um, Addison's disease and Cushing syndrome. These two are kind of opposite of each other, and these have a lot to do with Addison's disease being deficiency of all of these things over here in the cortex side, and then um, Cushing's disease being um, too much of all of these things on the cortex side. And then the last one, the um, long one, pheochromocytoma, has to do with um, too much of this or too much adrenaline, too much fight or flight. So I didn't really find a, a good short video on Addison's disease, but I found this one, which is absolutely horrid. Um, but sometimes a video is so horrible that you actually remember things from it. And that's what happened with me as I watched this. I thought, oh my gosh, that's the stupidest thing ever. But then I remembered it. So I went ahead and included it here. And don't judge. <laughs> um, trust me, if you watch it, you'll think it's so horrible that you'll actually remember stuff from it. Um, and then over here we have what happens. So deficiency. Deficiency of cortisol and aldosterone is going to result in, for instance, low sodium and dehydration. So we have hypovolemia and hyponatremia is two of the main effects. This is one of the few diseases where you actually get to eat as much salt as you want. So I always remember that about Addison's disease because I'm always trying to watch my sodium intake and I think it would be maybe fun for just one day to have Addison's disease and get to um, have all the salt I wanted. Um, the other thing that happens is hypoglycemia because we don't have enough of the um, cortisol hyper and hypo skin pigmentation and I know that seems like how can you have both I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide and then lack of secondary sex characteristics so here you can see I have a nice little zebra background and that can happen with the like I said the hypo and the hyper um, pigmentation I have that right here and so some places on the skin will be very very pale and then um, it's, and this has to do with that melanocyte simulating hormone. So places that are exposed to sun can get really dark bronze color, and then other places can be extremely pale, so it kind of results in this zebra striping of the skin. Um, here is kind of an, another rundown of everything that um, I've talked about already, and then pay particular attention to this teaching box on page 1030. If you'll look over at this box right here, it's called adrenal crisis here, but sometimes this is known as Addisonian crisis, and you need to be familiar with these symptoms. We've already talked about them, um, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, extreme hypotension or low blood pressure, which can result in dehydration, confusion, um, syncope here, and... Um, this would be the Addisonian crisis. Treatment is going to be replacing those missing hormones, so um, the glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and that will be for life. So I have lifelong hormone replacement therapy down here. Um, having an um, emergency kit with dexamethasone is a, another thing that the patients need to have. 
I'll cover its opposite Cushing's in the next video.